friends, good morning and welcome to Rise and Shine, a daily Bible study that inspires, informs, and impacts your life in ways that you never imagined possible. As we gather today, we're going to be taking a look at Luke chapter 6. Uh, we're starting to get into the confrontations that are beginning to develop between Jesus and um, the, the, the Pharisees, the, the political powers of the day. But also his momentum is growing and you're beginning to see his ministry uh, start to flourish. Well, we've got a lot to cover. We're um, excited to get involved and I hope that you're continuing to, to grow and, and experience new life uh, as we open up God's word. As we begin today, we want to take a look at our prayer. We want to share uh, the good things that are happening and invite God to do new and wonderful things. Would you join with me as we pray for our church? Father, I pray that you'll bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. Amen. Now, by doing so, we, we acknowledge that life is an adventure to be lived, not a burden to be carried. And so we are looking for new things. We are expecting new things, new challenges, new opportunities. And so as we open up God's word, I guarantee today will challenge you in some powerful ways if you, if you let it. Uh, so let us ask for a courageous heart. A courageous heart is that kind of a heart that is willing to go beyond uh, what it can see, what it understands, but believes deeply that God has a plan for them. Would you join with me as we pray together? God, grant me a courageous heart willing to explore the unknown, trusting your voice to guide me. Save me from the emptiness of easy answers and safe shelters. Let me be bold and brave, willing to sacrifice temporary comforts and simple answers to find wonders beyond my wildest dreams. My heart tells me I was made for more, that all these things are possible with your help. So grant me courage to take the next bold step. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to just jump right into chapter 6. Uh, and as we go through it, we're going to take a look at how Luke is beginning to show the tensions that are building, uh, the daily life of Jesus and his disciples, and how his ministry is unfolding in a unique way. Let us begin. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain and rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Of course, some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. When Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogues and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on a Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up, stand up in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around them and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and, the man, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing all of them. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, 
when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will weep and mourn. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how the, their ancestors treated the false prophets. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Blessed, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on, the, on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. To others, do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who hate them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. But if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look for the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the what the heart is full of. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man who is building a house, who dug deep down and laid the foundation on the rock. When the floods came, the torrents struck the house, but they could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my word and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we see here that the trend is beginning to shift, right? You're seeing that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are now kind of aligned against Jesus. They are now looking for reasons to accuse him. Luke is now giving two conflicts. Um, first of all, he, he showed two wonderful ways that Jesus has brought healing um, to the paralyzed man and um, to, the, to the man with leprosy. But now you're going to see on the other side two times of conflict that, of things that are happening on the Sabbath. Certainly the one with the grain and the other one with the apostles. Now, the one thing that I want you to draw your attention to is how these stories are opened up. Um, it begins by saying one Sabbath um, uh, on another Sabbath, uh, one of those days. These are ways of Luke trying to say these are not just, you know, these are not just a chronolo chronology of events that have happened. But these are the type of things that were happening to Jesus on a regular basis. These are two things that, that were recorded, but these are the kind of attacks that were happening against him. Um, on, on just an average Sunday, Jesus and his disciples were going through a grain field, okay? And so they have this uh, moment of attack. 
Now, Jesus kind of brings to them, um, and notice how as they were coming, they begin to reject what he's doing, saying, well, like, why are you doing what is not in, in the law? Why are you not doing what is happening uh, on Sabbath, what the Torah, right? So if you believe in your heart that Jesus is against the, the Torah, Jesus is being confronted by that and saying, why are you not doing what our dietary laws say? Now, it's interesting how Jesus responds, right? Have you never read what David did? He now refers back to the scriptures um, to show that the, these events by David and his disciples, that as they were traveling through, they ate the bread that was consecrated to God, right? This is in, in their history, um, and he's referring back to that. Now, it's interesting that he refers back to scriptures. And he said, how do you read this, right? How do you understand the scriptures that you are referring back to me? So the question is, is for all of us. This is something for all of us. When we come to the scriptures, how do we approach the text? Um, do we look for reasons to reaffirm what we already want to do? Notice that as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, one of the things I think Jesus railed against them about is they did not come to the scriptures with an open heart. They, they did not come with an idea of, um, Lord, teach me now uh, what you would have me to do. Right? They, they came with kind of a closed mind. They already knew the answer that they, they wanted. They just needed to find the text that would prove it. Have you ever seen that in people in either their worship or their approach to God? There's a great quote that, you know, sometimes disciples come to, to God and say, um, Lord, listen to me for your servant is speaking. Instead of say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Are you able to hear the difference? You know, have you ever in your own prayers just kind of said, Lord, here are the things that I want. Your, your servant is speaking, so you should be listening. And we never take time to say, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. When we come to the scriptures, we should be saying, Lord, speak to us now about who we are, the path we're on, and sometimes the, the confusion that kind of muddles our brains from time to time. They also did not come with, with a hungry heart, right? They did not come with a sense of expectation. We should all come to the scriptures with a neediness of, Lord, reveal to us what is happening in our own world. They came with a sense of uh, expectation of, they came, the, it says the, the Pharisees in verse uh, chapter seven, in verse seven, it says the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Sometimes when we come to the scriptures, we come with a preconceived notion of what we want. We don't come with a, with a hunger or a neediness. Um, we don't come expectantly, right? What is it that you are expecting that God will reveal something powerful? That's why I think it's important for us to pray prior to every reading. Lord, I am here to learn, to grow, to grow in wisdom, to be shaped and conformed into the image of Christ. How many of you, when you come to your time of Bible study, come with paper and pencil in hand? Lord, teach me that I can record and I can learn and I can adapt and apply something that I've learned to my life. One of our goals as a part of this Bible study is to give you something that you can apply every day. Have you, do you ever approach each day, every morning you get up in the morning, you kind of get up expectantly. Something has been given to me today that I need to learn. Something to capture, either good or bad, about my behavior. And then to take time and reflect on it at the end of the day. Lord, what worked really well? You know, what didn't work really well? What was your closest moment to God today? Uh, do you come expectantly? You see, the Pharisees came and they expected to catch Jesus in something that they could use against him. And so when they come to the Sabbath and there's a man with a shriveled hand, there's some thought that this shriveled hand was not just, you know, a, a, a malady, but it, it made the man unable to work for a living. And therefore, it would take him from a, a life that was thriving to a life of servitude or, or of begging um, and, and therefore totally dependent. And what Jesus is trying to do is saying, look at this man who is now uh, 
his, his humanity and his dignity has been taken away from him. And of course, they're trying to be more interested, but is Jesus going to follow the rules and do work? Or is he going to ignore them and just move on? And, and here's the point that I, I really want you to capture today. Um, with the man with the withered hand, they're trying to find a charge. Luke makes it very clear. Jesus is saying something very powerful here. If you look, he said, I'm going to ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do evil? Jesus is here is saying, even to neglect to acknowledge this man is doing something, right? You're either going to be action oriented. You're either going to do one thing or you're going to do another. Um, this is that time of what is called the death of compassion, right? That Jesus here is at this point, he's taking a look um, at how we connect with other people. Jesus is saying that our inactivity is in fact an action that we will be held accountable to. And he will say this throughout the scriptures. You know, people that were stunned, like, you know, when did we not see you, Lord? And Jesus said, because you were inactive, you were actually doing evil. And so he looks at, he said, which of these two are you going to do? You're going to do something. Um, one will, you will always be doing something. To act is to do good. Are you going to save life? Or to refuse is also to do evil, um, to destroy life. So Jesus is not giving you a middle ground here. He's saying you're either going to be good and do something positive, or you're going to do evil and neglect and be apathetic. So there's no middle ground. There's also this time that you see in Revelation when it talks about um, the church whenever it's lukewarm, right? He said, I could deal with you if you're hot or cold, but because you think you're in the middle, you're, you're in neither, neither uh, situation. And therefore, that's the hardest one to be in. And of course, they don't know what to do. They look around. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, try and reach out. And as he extends his hand, his hand is fully restored. Jesus chooses to do good. But notice its impact. People were not just amazed, but they were also, the teachers of the law were furious, and they began to plot against him. And so even Jesus' work on the Sabbath of doing good begins to, to reveal the, the current state of their heart. Now, what's interesting is Jesus' momentum is growing, right? So now we have the calling of the disciples. And the thing that I want you to get out of this is it begins in prayer. Luke wants you to know that every great moment in Jesus' ministry is on a mountainside in prayer, right? The point here is, if you, even if you go back to Jesus' 40 days of temptation, um, Matthew has Jesus going to a mountain. The, the, Satan takes him to a mountainside and shows him the whole kingdoms of the world. Luke doesn't do that. For Luke, mountainsides and mountaintops are holy places, places of prayer. And so here he goes to the mountainside and he prays and he spends all night in prayer prior to the calling of the disciples. So the point of here is that the disciples are not just a random group of guys that were called together. These are things that Jesus has prayed over. He mulled, he's mulled over. These are not people that were just um, picked out of random. So he calls his disciples. Now, you're going to see a transition of names, right? The disciples, disciples literally mean learners, students, people that learn from a master, from a teacher. But Jesus' intent is to call these 12 as disciples to make them apostles. Apostles are considered ambassadors. They are considered envoys of some great leader. They then speak with their voice. They have their power and their authority. They are also called to be sent out. Ambassadors do not stay at home. They are sent out into the world to represent the kingdom that they were sent from. So these are the disciples, these are the, the apostles that were called um, and given the authority of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about this is obviously the names that are here, but also the, the combination. And the one that I really want to draw your attention to is that he's calling Matthew, the tax collector, okay, as well as Simon the zealot. Now, the zealot means those that were 
powerfully trying to remove Rome from, uh, from Israel to reestablish Jewish authority. The Romans were a thorn in their side. And so you had these revolutionaries um, that were out, you know, out in the, the countryside uh, doing kind of guerrilla warfare against the Romans. Um, that was a zealot, that people that advocated for the attack and to remove the Rome from uh, by military force. So you can imagine um, that, that Simon the Zealot sitting down with and conversing with Matthew the tax collector, the one that worked with the Romans to collect tax against his own people. It's interesting, these are the people that Jesus is bringing together people from diverse backgrounds that are able to sit around a table and say, can we find a better way? Is there a better way, Jesus, to live as human beings together other than by military conflict or by acquiescing our values um, to what we believe? So Jesus is bringing them together and building a coalition that's going to be powerful. Following that, um, it tells us that... Um, that this is where you get, um, so then he went down, um, a large crowd of his disciples, okay? So there was a large crowd of learners out of which, now I'm, I'm reading in verse 17, a large crowd of disciples that had gathered from Judea, Jerusalem, and the area of Tyre and Sidon. So it, it represented all of those people that were now following Jesus are his disciples. They're his students. But out of that, he calls the 12 who would be his apostles, his envoys, those special people. Following that, Jesus goes into this first, it's really his summation of the new kingdom order that is coming, right? We call it in Matthew's gospel, we call it the Beatitudes. Here we call it kind of uh, the blessings, uh, the healing from, it's called the Beatitudes from the mountainside. Um, when he does this, Luke changes the tone or the tenor just ever so slightly, and I want to draw some things out to you. First of all, when Matthew would say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Luke is changing that slightly, and he said, blessed are the poor. Now, does he mean financially poor, poor in spirit, emotionally? Uh, blessed are you who hunger, for you who weep. Blessed are are you when you are rejected and hated and insult? So Luke is really putting the emphasis on the downtrodden. And he said, but, but you will be blessed. And so what you're seeing, right, is Jesus is flipping our whole social order on its head. To be a successful person means that you've risen to the top of the pyramid, that you're rich, you're powerful, you're happy, you're hungry, you're full. That's the kingdom life. And Jesus is saying, if, if that is your pursuit, if that is your highest goal here in this world, then you will receive it. But that's all you will receive. Because in the second half, he says, woe to you who are rich, because you have received your comfort. What Jesus is really talking about here is if that's what your highest goals are, is to be rich, well-fed, well-thought-of, the highest order, you will receive it here, you will get it, but that's all you will get. You, you will not look for the kingdom of God that God has in store for you. And so oftentimes it's we sell ourselves so short. We want to be happy in this world, not realizing what God has for us in the, in the world to come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it said, No, I has seen, no mind conceived, no heart can feel the things that God has prepared for those who love him. If this is the best that it is for you, then this is all that you get. But Jesus is saying, woe to you because you have sacrificed the joyful living in, in the kingdom of God that God has prepared for you. Right? So it, it, is, it is totally changing our world perspective. And that's why Jesus is pulling together these new disciples, these apostles, to hear this new word. This is what they're signing up for, to take this world order of whether it's the Jewish way, whether it's the Roman way. And Jesus is creating a third way for humanity of saying it should be different. And, and so he elaborates. He said, what does that look like? He's, he goes on and he said, now, um, 
But listen to what I say. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. That is totally counterintuitive, right? How do we do that? But what Jesus is trying to do is saying, this is how we break out of the world in which we are, where everybody is looking out for themselves. Everybody is living out of scarcity and fear. He said, until we change that mindset, if we have a world that is only living for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, well, pretty soon we're going to be toothless and blind. He said, but if we can change that mindset, if we can learn about forgiveness and grace, then perhaps nations and wars and famines will be a thing of the past. This is the pathway of ultimate peace. Is it easy? No, because our world is all about confrontation and competition. It's not about grace and it's not about truth and it's not about forgiveness. So he goes through this whole list and he's saying, what good is it if you lend to somebody and then you expect it back? You, you, you've gotten exactly what you want. What if you do good to only those people that can be good to you? Well, then all of a sudden you become tribal and everybody's battling against the other people. We as the church are the ones that welcome in, or we should be the community that welcomes all in regardless of where they are, how much money they have, their jobs, their situation. We welcome them in into the household of faith. He then goes on to say, if the blind, he, he tells a couple of parables and he's making this connection. This is the first place, especially in Luke's gospel, where he's making this connection between the fruit, that what you bear and the kind of tree that you are. Now, the interesting thing here is fruit does not come instantaneously. It's something that has to be developed over time. Trees grow. They have to be developed. They have to be cared for. They have to be pruned and nurtured. You don't just put a tree in the ground and then tomorrow it, it bears fruit. It takes time and development. But it bears fruit out of what it has been uh, tended for, what it is created for. And so that's always the challenge. What kind of fruit? Um, and he's not here talking about just you know, the, the good things that happen. But as we will see in, in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, all of the fruit of the Spirit that well up and overflow, not just abundance in, in things and possessions, but in character and in depth. Um, out of the goodness of his heart, they well up. And of course, Jesus then, this is, we often use these, par these passages to talk about generosity. Generosity comes from an overflow of gratitude. Are you grateful for the things that you have? All you have to do is look at how generous a person is. And of course, he goes in and he talks about uh, if you give, it will be given to you in such a way that it will f overflow in generosity. Out of the goodness of, of a person's heart is what they, they talk about. So it's, a, it's our speech and it's our generosity. He finally ends with the parable um, about building a house. And again, it, it's important to understand that Jesus is saying the house is built in stages, right? What is your foundation? What is it the core of who you are? That's the foundation, right? It doesn't matter whether you built you know, a, a great mansion or whether you just have a little A-frame. It's all about the foundation that you build on. What is your solid foundation? What is it at your very core? And for all of us, our foundation is defined by what we committed to. You cannot have a solid foundation if you're just a part-time Christian. You cannot understand the deep things of God if you just kind of take it hit or miss. What you're committed to, whether it's your relationship with your spouse, your friends, your church, your own spiritual development, Anything that you want to really have as a solid foundation, you have to commit to. And so as we continue to grow, Jesus said, look, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? There's kind of a funny story that is told by Francis Chan. He tells it about how he came into the house one day and he told his daughter to go up and clean a room. She said, it's Saturday. You got to clean your room. That's part of your responsibility. And so he his daughter kind of sulked away and went upstairs and, and pretty soon came down and, and she said, Dad, you, you'd be so proud of me. She said, I memorized the verse that you gave me. 
that you should remain clean by cleaning your, the house of your abode. And he looked at her kind of strange, like, what are you talking about? And she said, and dad, my, my friends and I, we're going to come over and we're going we're to study that, that passage in Greek. We're going to learn what it meant in, in its original language. He said, why are you studying what I said and not doing what I said? I wanted you to do it, not study it. Jesus tells us to, to love one another even as much as he has loved us, to go out and to share joyfully what we have been given. And Jesus is saying, why have you studied the words in the original language in the Greek, but you've never really put them into practice? What Jesus here is telling us is it's up at our foundation. Are we going to do what he has asked us to do? The Pharisees were trying to find out whether Jesus was going to violate the Torah. And Jesus said, one way or another, you're either going to do good or you're going to do evil. You're going to engage in life or you're going to stand off at a distance and just watch others. And that in and of itself is evil. It's partnering with evil. Well, friends, Jesus is challenging our very foundation of our society He's challenging the very core of what it means to be a Christian. And I hope that it's challenging you to say, am I more like the Pharisees? I stand off and I watch and I, I wonder what Jesus is going to do. He said that in and of itself is evil. Or are you rolling up your sleeves, getting busy, and going out and reaching out to other people, making a real lasting difference in their lives, and especially in your own life? Well, friends... Now we're going to make a tran another transition in chapter 7. So I hope that we'll get to see you uh, tomorrow. And in the process, maybe there's somebody that you can share uh, God's word with them and tell them that it's making an impact in your life. Hey, friends, until the next time, I hope that you continue to bear good fruit. I hope that you begin to tend the roots. And I hope that you go undergo a little bit of pruning, because when you do that, those new shoots are going to bear good, good, lasting fruits. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest upon you and give you peace. Friends, until next time, God bless.